Um, I'm going to talk about an open problem today. I've been exploring, playing with the idea that a, a nice thing to do with some of our time at conferences is to talk about open problems and obstacles and issues. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's on Zoom, which a few years ago I was, you know, thought it wouldn't work at all to give talks on Zoom. But over the last few years, I've learned that, that, that it's something we can do and, and I'm able to visit a lot more places. Um, and even though I'm on Zoom, um, it's very, very possible to stop and ask questions and go over things. Um, I'll check in from time to time, um, but please also feel free to stop me anytime. Okay. Um, so this is a problem that Hugh Montgomery raised in the 19, early 1970s in, in, in analytic number theory. Um, but it is somewhat parallel to the restriction conjecture in harmonic analysis that Eli Stein raised at about the same time. Um, and uh, I, I gave this talk at the a version of this talk at the Stein Memorial Conference a couple of weeks ago. So I was reflecting on, on the two problems. Um, and um, the restriction problem is still open, but between 1970 and now, there's been a lot of progress on it, a lot of incremental progress. And in contrast to that, there's been very little progress on Montgomery's problem since, he, since his work on the problem around 1970. Um, so in this talk, I want to discuss what's known about the problem and the issues that make it hard to go further. Um, I think it's an interesting particular problem, and I think also it has neat applications to number theory, but I think also as a harmonic analyst that there's an interesting uh, harmonic analysis issue uh, to try to understand better. Okay, so here's the problem. It's about Dirichlet polynomials. So let me tell you what that is. Um, so a Dirichlet polynomial is a finite sum of some coefficients times e to the i t log m. And the motivation for that is it appears in studying zeta functions like the Riemann zeta function. So the, you know, the classic formula for the Riemann zeta function, um, sum n equals one to infinity n to the minus s, um, that thing is a Dirichlet, an infinite Dirichlet polynomial. And uh, there are a lot of other Dirichlet polynomials that come up in trying to understand it. Okay. And then the, the one question we can ask, a harmonic analysis question is, what can you say about the LP norm of the, of the Dirichlet <laughs> polynomial? Um, so it's defined for all real numbers. So we have to cut it off on some interval, say from zero to T. And we ask how big could the LP norm of the Dirichlet polynomial be if the coefficients are all bounded by something? So this was the conjecture that Montgomery made and it's motivated by a couple of simple examples. The first example is if you take all of these coefficients to be one, um, then at the point T equals zero, this sum will be N and it will be approximately n close to t equals zero. And that big spike produces this term, this n here. The second example is you could take the coefficients to be random, plus or minus one randomly. And then for almost every t, you expect to have square root cancellation in this sum. So the size of d of t would be about root n most of the time. And that accounts for this term here. This um, double squiggle means that we're hiding something like a t to the epsilon, uh, where epsilon is arbitrarily small. And um, we'll come back to that, to that issue. Okay, but basically the conjecture says that nothing worse than these two basic examples occurs. Um, Montgomery was motivated by estimating how many zeros the Riemann zeta function has in different rectangular boxes. Um, and that helps to understand the distribution of primes, like especially primes in short intervals. That's an interesting story, but it's aside from the harmonic analysis. So I, I won't do any more detail about it um, in, today. Okay. So that's the question. Um, part one, I'd like to explain how this question is similar to a bunch of questions from restriction theory in harmonic analysis. Okay, so first of all, um, there's a, a general class of extension operators. If we have a measure on R to the D or on some other abelian group, someplace where we have a Fourier transform, then we can take the extension operator for that measure. And the definition is um, extension operator for the measure mu of function F means 
take function f, multiply it by measure mu, and take its Fourier transform. And a typical problem that we study is for a given measure, estimate the best constant c in this inequality. Is it, you know, is it finite or infinite? And if it's finite, uh, how accurately can we approximate it? So, the, so for example, Stein considered the case where mu is the surface measure on the sphere s d minus one in R d. Um, and then, so that this is, this is then the restriction problem for the sphere. Okay, so um, our problem looks like that and let's put them on a, a sort of common footing. So here's our Dirichlet polynomial. The measure mu um, is a sum of delta functions at log n, where n goes in the range in the Dirichlet polynomial. Um, and um, let's say g of log n is the coefficient b sub n. And then the Dirichlet polynomial is just the extension operator for this measure applied to this function. Uh, and the problem that um, the problem that Montgomery raised is basically this extension problem um, with this measure. Okay. Um, so that's one reference point. It's um, somewhat like the extension problem for the sphere, and we'll we'll develop that a little bit more as we go along. Um, here's another reference point. Um, uh, another thing that people tried is looking for the extension operators for random subsets or random measures. This clean is to say in, in some finite settings. So to give ourselves a finite setting, let's say z sub t is integers modulo t. And I take a subset of integers modulo t. And to have a normalization that matches Montgomery's problem, I'll say this, the cardinality of the subset is n. Now, if I have a function on this subset, uh, extension operator of the subset a of g, uh, means that I do this, I sum up g of a times e of ax over t. It's essentially the same definition as before, and the measure would be a sum of delta masses on the elements of the set a. Okay, um, so for if we choose a randomly, then people have figured out how the uh, extension operator behaves. And in particular, there's an important theorem by Brogan in the late 80s, which also goes by the name of the lambda of p problem. And he proved that if A is a random subset with cardinality n, then with high probability, the LP norm of EAG is at most a certain basic, a certain thing times the L2 norm of G. And if I wanted to put L infinity, I can just use holder um, to get to L infinity. Um, and we get an expression there that is, looks almost the same as Montgomery's expression. So this um, Dirichlet polynomial is analogous to this EA of G. It's a sum of coefficients times complex exponentials, coefficients times complex exponentials. And um, the theorem or conjecture says the LP norm is bounded by this same factor times the L infinity norm of the coefficients. Um, so with hindsight, Montgomery's conjecture could be to, could be saying that um, the set of frequencies log n behaves similarly to a random set of frequencies, at least in terms of this inequality. Okay. Now, the, the, these expressions here and here, they occur for the same reason, the same examples. Um, uh, so, so, so this is sharp. These are both sharp. And, and it's because of the same two basic examples that we illustrated for um, Montgomery's conjecture, those two examples didn't really require any special information about the frequencies, so they work just as well in this general setting. Okay, so that's another reference point for Montgomery's conjecture. It sounds at first like it might be a great clue because this inequality looks so much like that inequality, um, but, uh, but there's a problem, which is that the proof of Brogan's theorem, it's, it's telling us what happens typically for a random set, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't obviously give any information for any specific set. And it's actually an open problem in general for a general P to, to produce explicit sets A where we can prove this inequality. Okay, so that was part one, how this Montgomery conjecture kind of fits into the landscape of 
of harmonic analysis, things that might be more familiar, things that were more familiar to me in harmonic analysis. And it's a good moment to pause and check in and see if people have questions or comments. Um, well, I, I was, didn't Morgan prove something about uh, Montgomery implying Kakea? Morgan did prove something about Montgomery implying Kakea. Um, we'll get there, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later in our discussion. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let's move on to some methods. What, what techniques do we have to prove things about the Montgomery problem? And more generally, what techniques do we have to prove things for extension operators of the form E sub A? So I, I'd like to um, study, find implications of the form, some condition about the set A implies some kind of LP bound about the extension operator associated to A. And I'll show you um, some of the, uh, so, you know, I'll show you basically all the things we know about the Montgomery problem. And these are some of the fundamental things that we know about in general extension operators E sub A. Okay. Um, oh, actually, let me say a little bit more. So suppose we're given a set A and Z sub T, and this set secretly was drawn randomly, a random subset of size N. So in fact, it, with high probability, it obeys the bound from Bourgain's theorem, but that's not a proof. And if you give us only, say, polynomial time, what LP bounds can we actually prove about this operator? Um, the things that we know about Montgomery's problem are actually very similar to what we know about this problem. What can we actually prove about a typical extension operator, typical random extension operator? And I'm gonna describe some of most of the things in the context of this problem because it's just a little bit cleaner and, and everything, all the ideas apply to the Montgomery problem equally well. Okay, the first most basic tool is orthogonality. Um, so orthogonality gives us an L2 equality, it's Parseval's equality. Um, and the normal, because of the normalizations that we've adopted, it says that the L2 norm of EA of G is T uh, squared, is T times the L2 norm of G squared. The T is just a normalization. It's the L2 norm squared of one of these complex uh, exponentials. And the proof is just that the different complex exponentials are orthogonal to each other. That's orthogonality. Okay, so that's L2. The next easiest thing, ah, oh yeah, and, and okay, that also works for Dirichlet polynomials. So here's our Dirichlet polynomial. And now we'd like to say that these functions here are orthogonal on our interval that we're studying, zero T. That's not exactly true, but they are approximately orthogonal as long as T is bigger than N. I'll leave out the details, but that's the sort of thing that's cleaner in working in Z mod T than it is in working uh, with the actual Montgomery problem. But it's also not, it's just technical. It's not, not that difficult or that big a deal. Okay. And the next easiest thing to work with are even integer powers. And the reason is the following. So the extension operator is a trigonometric sum like this. And if suppose I'd like to take an even integer moment. So I'd like to sum up its norm to the power 2s, where this s is a natural number. Uh, okay, so I can write that as extension operator to the S norm squared. And the thing that's nice about that is the extension operator to the power S is still a trigonometric polynomial. We raise this thing to the power S and, and multiply it all out. And um, when you do that, because of the uh, group character property of the complex exponential, because of it, because of, because E of A times E of B is E of A plus B. Um, you expand it out and you get a formula like this. Okay, and then you can take its L, you can uh, uh, think about its L2 norm using Parseval, and these here are the coefficients. Okay, so the new coefficients are a sum of a bunch of terms that have to do with the old coefficients. Um, and a, an important character is how many different terms are in this sum. So we give that a name, R sub S comma A of B, is the number of ways of writing B as a sum of S elements of the set A. Um, and if you know something about this function, then you can figure out something about the 2S 
uh, norm of, of EA of G. You could know different things, but a convenient one I'll call condition one is that this function behaves, I would say, pseudo randomly. So if the set A was a random set of N elements, there are N to the S choices of A1 up to AS, and they would be even the, the sums A1 plus dot 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 plus AS would be evenly distributed over ZT. So each B would be hit about this many times. So here's condition one that that's approximately true. So condition one is true for a random set with high probability. <coughs> Excuse me. And something you can check efficiently in polynomial time. And um, with appropriate technical modifications, it's true for the set of logarithms that appears in Montgomery's problem. Okay. And um, a classical proposition says that if you have this condition, then you get an optimal estimate for the 2s norm of EAG. So this thing, uh, this expression is the best you could hope for because of the two basic examples we discussed at the beginning. Okay, so that's one fundamental technique that works especially for even integer powers. <laughs> so, uh, so Montgomery did this and he proved that the conjecture is true when his conjecture is true when P is an even integer. Whereas for every other value of P, the conjecture is still open. That shows how special and powerful this even integer trick is. Similarly, Bergan's theorem was proven for even integer P before he proved it in general and the even integer case is, is easier. Um, and when P is an even integer, there are explicit sets that uh, have the sharp inequality Whereas for general, for most general P, we don't know. Examples. Okay. Um, okay. So the next general technique um, in the in, in the setting of um, of Montgomery's problem is called a large value estimate, which means just an estimate for the size of a super level set. So let's make some notation. Um, w lambda of f is the set of points where the norm of f is bigger than lambda. And estimating this for many different lambda has very similar information to estimating the LP norm for different piece. Okay, so that's a large value estimate. Um, all right. Um, Okay, so now here's the input for Montgomery's large value estimate. So remember, here's the definition of the extension operator. And to get a sense for this extension operator, a reasonable thing to do is to input the function one. Uh, in other words, the function that's, your G is only defined on A anyway, so that's the function that's one on A. So if G is always one, you get this sum, and this is also called A hat of X. So for instance, to get a feel for the Stein restriction conjecture, we take the function one and, and plug it in and see what are the LP norm of the output. And that's a, that's a natural thing to do for any extension problem. Okay, so, um, so if A were random, here's what would happen. A hat of zero would be N. That's true for any A with N elements because, okay. Um, and then for all the other x's, a hat of x would have square root cancellation approximately. So here's condition two, a hat of zero is n, and a hat of x is almost bounded by root n for all the other x's. Okay, so that's true for a random set a with high probability. It's something again that you can check in polynomial time. Um, and in the setting of Dirichlet polynomials, uh, this is conjectured to be true. Some ver appropriate version of this is conjectured to be true, but it's not known yet. But there are some bounds in this direction that are a little bit weaker. Um, so and for Dirichlet polynomials, what Montgomery used was um, not this, but, but some weaker estimate that can be proven. Um, okay. okay, so Montgomery produced a method to take an input of this form, condition like this. And actually, you could, this could be flexible. And it outputs an estimate of the following kind. So if A obeys condition two, and if lambda is bigger than some cutoff, then the super level set W lambda of EAG is bounded by something times the L2 norm squared of G. Okay. 
So let's digest this a little bit. Okay, the first thing to notice is that this conclusion here is extremely strong. Um, if we knew this conclusion for all of the lambdas, uh, that would immediately imply Montgomery's conjecture uh, and it would be stronger. But Montgomery conjectured this stronger version too. Um, so, um, you know, the form, it, it, it takes a little algebra to sort of digest the formula, but let me just tell you that th this conclusion is as strong as you could possibly hope for. Uh, on the other hand, there's this hypothesis that lambda has to be fairly big in order for the conclusion to kick in. This range of lambda includes some interesting values. It's certainly not trivial, but it also excludes some important uh, values. And if lambda is smaller than our cutoff, then this theorem doesn't tell us anything about W lambda. And as we'll see, it's difficult to modify the method to learn anything um, when lambda is below the cutoff. So I, I think that's actually where the phrase large value estimate comes from. It's because the estimate, it only works for large values of land. Okay, so here's how the proof works. Oh, actually, let me take another little pause. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the proof. Um, the proof is somewhat similar to um, the proof of the Thomas Stein theorem in, in restriction theory. And in particular, the key thing is a TT star <laughs> kind of argument. And that was interesting to me because it happened at, <laughs> at approximately the same time in the 1970s. Um, and what seemed, what felt like two different fields at the time but in hindsight, you see that they're, they're related to each other. Okay, so here's how the proof goes. Um, okay, so we have our extension operator like this, and we take some set W in, the, it's like a set of X's, and eventually it will be the set W lambda. And then we're gonna restrict EAG to W, and we call that EA comma W of G. We just take EA, uh, sorry, um, we just take e, the function EAG of X and we multiply it by the characteristic function of W. Okay, now this is a linear operator. It's, it's a matrix basically in our setting because everything is finite dimensional. And the key ingredient is we're going to estimate the norm of this matrix. So the two to two norm of this matrix. Um, and one, helpful thing is that the two to two norm of the matrix squared is the two to two norm of matrix matrix star, matrix adjunct. So this is a fundamental e equality from linear algebra. Okay, and the other nice thing is that this matrix here is, has an explicit clean form. Okay, so <coughs> yeah, so let me, ma let me, show you quickly what these two matrices look like. So the matrix EAW, what does it look like? Uh, over here are elements of A and over here are elements of W. So suppose we take a column with little a and a row with little x. Um, then what goes here is uh, just E of AX over T. So you know, if I took the ZT by ZT matrix with that thing in the each entry, that's the Fourier transform. And I'm just restricting the frequencies in the Fourier transform to one set, capital A, and I'm restricting the X values in the Fourier transform to a different set, capital W. Okay, now what happens when I take EAW and I multiply it by EAW adjunct? So now I have a square matrix, both uh, sides are indexed by W. And over here I have X1 and over here I have X2. And the matrix entry that I get there is A hat of X1 minus X2. Okay, so these are routine computations, uh, or they, I guess this is a routine computation. So it's equal to this, to that. 
Um, and so if you look at the, um, so you look at this matrix, our hypothesis, which was a hypothesis about a hat, it exactly tells us stuff about this matrix. Okay, so the diagonal entries of this matrix is when x1 equals x2, we get a hat of zero, which is always n, the, the cardinality of a. And the off diagonal entries are a hat of somebody who's not zero. And by hypothesis, those are pretty small. Okay, so the matrix looks like this, n, 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 and junk. And all of this junk is the norm of each junk entry is pretty small. Okay, so now um, uh, this description of this matrix lets us estimate the norm of the matrix. Basically, it's a good idea to think of this matrix as a sum of two parts, n times the identity, which has norm n, and the junk, uh, which um, whose norm uh, in the worst case is when all of these entries are positive and they have this size. And then you can check what the norm is. It's this, this bit. Okay. So using our hypothesis condition two that a hat of x is, is pretty small, then we get a bound on the norm of this matrix. Okay. Um, Okay, so now, so now we can um, we can prove Montgomery's large value estimate. Um, so far, we we figured out that um, so we assume a hat of x is small, um, and then we see that the two to two norm of this uh, e e star is is bounded by something. That's true for any set W, but we wanted to uh, estimate the large values. So let's set W to be W lambda of EAG. Okay, so lambda squared times the size of W, that's bounded by the L2 norm squared of EAG on W. And now that's bounded by the norm of the matrix EAW squared times GL2 squared. And that's the thing we just estimated. Okay, so we plug in our estimate. And we get that lambda squared W is bounded by two parts coming from these two parts here, which came from the two parts of this matrix. And one of them has uh, some junk times W. And there's a W on both sides of this equation. We want to get the W by itself. So the natural thing to do is to subtract this over to the other side. And that works beautifully if this blue thing is smaller than lambda squared. So if the blue factor is at most, say, half of lambda squared, we can rearrange, and we still have half of lambda squared w, which is bounded by n gl2 squared. Now we can get the w by itself. That's Montgomery's large value bound. Um, and the hypothesis that this blue stuff is smaller than a half lambda squared, um, that's, that's, a, that's the hypothesis that was in Montgomery's large value estimate. So that was, that's a very, uh, I think a very nice proof. Uh, and and that, that was, those are the, now the, the, the two things, the two main things that are known about Montgomery's conjecture. Okay. Um, do people have any questions or comments about this technique? Uh, I think we have one coming. Great. So, uh, did you say that this is optimal for this lambdas? I mean, lambda bigger than this number? Okay, that's a great question. Um, is it optimal to say that the lambda is bigger than this number? All right. So lambda bigger than the number, uh, it came here, so it was uh, lambda squared bigger than 
n to the half plus epsilon g l2 squared. So that was our hypothesis. So you could take the square root of both sides. OK, so, so it, um, if we could, we, we could improve this if and only if we could make this blue stuff smaller, which the main way to do it, I think, would be to make this smaller. So let's go back and look at where the norm of this matrix came from and think about whether one could hope to make this any smaller. So the matrix looks like this. It's a W by W matrix. Um, it has ends along the diagonal, but th that's okay. The ends contributed this part, which we're not worried about. And then it has what I was calling junk uh, and the off diagonal entries. And so far, what we know about the junk is that the norm of each entry is bounded by this. Now, if the only thing we know about this matrix is that the norm of each entry is bounded by this, then this is the optimal norm. And the example is that um, these could all be positive. Um, and, um, um, and then we'd have a rank one matrix and the, the input vector would be all ones and you could check the norm of the what happens and the norm of the matrix will be this. Um, Actually, they don't have to be all positive. That's just one example. More generally, this could be any rank one matrix. So it could have the form um, some vector uh, outer product with some other vector. And if you and and, uh, and um, maybe these entries all have size one, and these entries all have size root n. Um, and and if you do that, it, it, would, it would still be sharp here. Okay. Now those matrices are very special. You know, random matrices certainly are not like that. And you know, given some matrix, it, it, maybe one could hope to prove better than that. Um, but the thing that has been very tricky in the context of Montgomery's problem is that we have to do this bound um, for all uh, choices of double, not just for one choice of double. So we're trying to analyze many different matrices and it seems to be hard to get a handle on. Um, I think that transitions nicely into the, the limits of our knowledge. Um, so, okay, so, so yeah, so, so, so that's one answer to the question. Like tactically, when we try to make this argument stronger, like what's difficult to do? But there's another answer to your very good question, which is that um, there is a closely related problem where that bound lambda bigger than n to the quarter plus epsilon GL2 is actually tight. And uh, the next part of the talk is I'm going to show you this example. Um, okay, so that's a, a nice segue into part three of the problem, the limits of our knowledge. So I showed you some things we can prove about the Montgomery conjecture. And now I want to show you something at the very edge, something that we can't prove, but that's at the very edge of, of what, we, what we know. Okay. So remember that we have our Dirichlet polynomial and we're supposing all the coefficients are smaller than one in norm. And we're going to look at this on some range from zero to T, it's a somewhat arbitrary parameter, um, but I'm gonna focus on a particular value, which is N to the three halves. Okay, and now we're gonna look at large level sets. So I'm gonna look at the places where D is bigger than N to the three quarters on this interval. And I wanna know how big that is. All right, so, so it's, it's basically the general problem, but I just picked lambda to be n to the three quarters and I picked t to be n to the three halves because those values illustrate nicely the limits of our knowledge. Okay, so we know that this is smaller than n and it's easy to prove. You can prove it by just finding the L2 norm of d on zero to t, or you can prove it with the L4 norm using our even integer method. And this is also at the edge of our understanding with the, uh, with the large value estimate, um, because um, if lambda was just a little bit bigger than n to the three quarters, that's when the large value estimate would kick in and it would give a much stronger bound for this thing. So I think it would, I think it would be like square root of n instead of n. 
Um, well, okay. As for the Dirichlet polynomial, we don't have the full condition too. But anyway, but at this point, a, a, a stronger bound would kick in. Um, anyway, so this n to the three quarters is exactly the the um, the edge of the hypothesis about lambda in the large value conjecture that you were mentioning. Okay, so that's what we know, and what we know is very basic. And the challenge is to improve it a tiny bit, say n to the one minus delta. Maybe even improving by a factor of log n would be would be would be new and interesting. Okay, now when I first saw this, I was very I was surprised because this proposition has a really easy proof. You just compute just orthogonality. You compute the L two norm of d, and you're you're done. So, so the proof was that short. I was surprised that it's so hard to improve it a tiny bit. Um, but then I, I learned about a cousin problem that helped me put it in perspective. The cousin problem is a small variation on this problem. And in the cousin problem, this proposition is sharp. You can't improve it. And I feel like that helps me a lot to understand why it's difficult to, uh, to improve our, our knowledge about, about Dirichlet polynomials. So here's the cousin problem. So first I'll re re it's, it's a cousin of Dirichlet polynomials. So remember, for Dirichlet polynomials, we have some frequencies that are log n. So let's say an is log n. The Dirichlet polynomial is a linear combination of e to the i t a n. Now, instead of a n, instead of frequencies log n, we cooked up another set of frequencies, a n tilde. And they are square root of little n over capital N. And then our um, modified Dirichlet polynomial is d tilde is a similar sum, it's just we use the frequencies a and tilde instead of the frequencies a. Okay, so these two problems uh, have a lot in common. Um, if you make two pictures of a n and a n tilde, they look kind of similar. What you see is the following. The sequence log n is like, it's kind of approximately evenly spaced, but if you look closely, the spacing between consecutive entries is getting smaller slowly. I don't know if I was able to capture that. So this is uh, getting smaller gradually. And, and this sequence has that same feature. Uh, also, we, do, we have capital N terms and uh, and, and the total difference from the first term to the last term is order of one. So that's similar too. <laughs> and um, uh, I believe that everything we talked about would apply equally well to this sequence and, and that sequence, at least as long as T is, is in the range we were talking about, like T equals N to the three halves. Those things are conjectural. So for instance, um, uh, condition two is hard to check for both of these sequences. Um, it's an open problem for both of these sequences, but I think it, it's, uh, it's good, I don't know, heuristic evidence, could do numerical evidence that in both cases, uh, condition two is true. Okay, so uh, it's a cousin problem that looks fairly similar, at least in terms of all the proof techniques that we have tried. But um, this one has a nifty uh, example where, uh, well, let, well, let me show you. Okay, now the special thing about the sequence that we cooked up is that it contains an arithmetic progression. Um, so I wrote this slightly wrong, so let me fix it. So the point is that as little n goes from n plus one to two n, it includes a bunch of square numbers. Um, and so if little n is m squared, then a little n tilde is the square root of m squared over n, which is m over square root of n. And that is an arithmetic progression because capital N is fixed and little, little n is changing. Um, so this is an arithmetic progression. Okay. Um, Um, and actually, maybe it's worth noting how long it is. So n is going in between capital N and two capital N. So our m squared needs to be in that range. So m 
is going between root n and root 2n. So the number of m is on the order of root n. So inside of here, we have a, an arithmetic progression, which is pretty long, has size around root n. And this arithmetic progression is the key to building an enemy example. So here's our enemy example. We're going to build a modified Dirichlet polynomial. And these coefficients are only going to be non-zero when n is a square, so that they're in that arithmetic progression. They're going to be zero everywhere else. And I picked a normalization uh, that I'll explain in a little bit, that it, when they are squares, they're n, it's n to the one quarter. OK, so now this d tilde has a very simple form. It's n to the one quarter that comes out, sum on m in this range, e to the i m over root n t. It's a geometric series. So you can sum the geometric series to understand everything that happens. Um, it's periodic with period square root of n, 2 pi square root of n um, in t. Um, and so it has, a, it has a peak at 0, because the, everything is positive here. So at 0, it has height n to the 3 quarters. That peak has a width of 1, because um, these frequencies here have size 1. So it has a peak like that, height of n to the 3 quarters and width 1. And then it is periodic with period square root of n. So that peak just recurs periodically uh, forever, and for example, up to n to the 3 halves. OK. So in particular, if you ask, how big is the set where d tilde is n to the 3 quarters in our interval that we were thinking about before in our, in our proposition, uh, it has size n. And that matches the upper bound, that very simple upper bound that we had for Dirichlet polynomials in the proposition. So I'm going to put, in a second, I'm going to put the um, enemy scenario and the proposition side by side so we can compare. OK, let's do that. So here was our challenge problem. We had a, a Dirichlet polynomial like this, <laughs> and the coefficients had size at most 1. And therefore, the sum of squares of the coefficients is at most n. And the sum of squares of coefficients often comes up in Fourier analysis. And our goal is to prove um, that this set is a bit smaller than n. But compare that with the enemy scenario. We have these slightly different frequencies, but they have a lot of the same properties. We have a, a slightly generalized Dirichlet polynomial. Our coefficients are. Um, mostly zero, and some of them are n to the quarter. But that normalization means that the sum of the squares is the same as before. And in the enemy scenario, the size of that same set is n. OK. So the point of this is that in order to make uh, a little bit of progress here, we have the easy bound that this thing is at most n. And if we want to make a little bit of progress here, we have to distinguish our actual setting from this enemy scenario. If you compare them, I put them side by side, you'll notice that there are actually two things that are different. And you might try to exploit either of these two things. Here are the two things that are different. The frequencies, the set of frequencies, is not the same. We have the frequencies log n instead of root little n over big n. You might try to take advantage of that. And um, the other thing you might try to do is that in this setting, we have a L infinity type hypothesis about the coefficients. They're each smaller than one. Whereas here, we have only a looser L2 type uh, hypothesis about the coefficients that the sum of the squares is around m. So you might try to distinguish the L infinity from the L2. But it, in order to make progress on the challenge problem, it is logically necessary to do one of these two things to distinguish the challenge problem from this enemy scenario. Okay, any questions or comments? Well, in, in your language of um, polynomial time, could you find an AP in, in polynomial time in one of those given sequence? Uh, okay, yes. 
Okay, okay, great. So the comment is that one crucial difference between this sequence and that sequence is that this one has a long AP in it and this one doesn't. Um, and in polynomial time, you can check that whether sequences contain uh, APs of various lengths, because there are only polynomially many arithmetic progressions to check. Um, so you could, so, so we could add that. We could say, okay, we know that this set A does not uh, contain any long APs, something like that. Um, but we, we know uh, we, or we, 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 we know some bounds on how long are the arithmetic progressions in, in this set. Um, right. Um, however, we don't know how to take advantage of, of bounds like that, uh, of hypotheses like that. My, when, when, my, when Hong Wang was a graduate student working with me, she came one day and she said, I, what do you think about this question? You have a set A that we're going to do, look at the extension operator for A and assume that the intersection of A with any arithmetic progression obeys some nice bounds. She wrote something down. <laughs> you can replace ar also arithmetic progression. Yeah, anyway, so, so suppose you it obeys something like that. Let's try to prove something about the, uh, the LP properties of the extension operator for A. Um, and um, I think it's a very nice problem, we, but we couldn't prove anything about it. Okay, good. Um, cool. So in spite of the fact that this one has a long AP and that one doesn't, I, I don't know how to use that. I don't, I don't know how to distinguish these in, in any useful way. <laughs> so I also thought a bunch about this one. And this one is kind of reminiscent of something from restriction theory. Um, so the Thomas Stein theorem is a restriction estimate where on the right-hand side, there's an L2 norm. Um, oh, hold on, there's a question in the chat. Let me see what that is. Okay, yeah, so what's the deal with arithmetic progressions? Um, so, um, so the question was, who, who contains arithmetic progressions? This set here, this contains an arithmetic progression of length square root of n. Um, this one contains only, if you wanted an exact arithmetic progression, it would, they would have to be very short because an arithmetic progression in log n's would correspond to a geometric progression in integers. And geometric progressions in integers between n and 2n have to be quite short logarithmic. Um, on the other hand, we'll see in a minute that this contains some approximate arithmetic progressions, which are a bit shorter than that. Okay, so why don't we go to the next topic, um, which is uh, wave packets. So wave packets have been a crucial tool for studying the extension operator for submanifolds of Rn, like including um, Stein's problem about extension operator for the sphere. And one of the things that they have helped us to do among many is to distinguish between having L2 or L infinity on the right-hand side, of the inequality. And wave packets have a version for Dirichlet polynomials. And that goes back to Brogan's work on the Montgomery conjecture in the late eighties that Michael mentioned. So I'm gonna recall that work for you. And then we'll think about uh, whether this tool might, might be helpful. Okay, um, so, so let's Eric? again, yeah. Uh, so if you replace the square root in the previous example with like, you know, one over P for whatever P, uh, what kind of property does that, like what kind of bad example does that give you? Or is like root, square root is exactly the optimal, you know, enemy example? Ah, great. Okay, so. In my enemy scenario, I had a n tilde was the square root of little n over big n. Um, 
and what happens if we replace square root by other things. So let's say that a n tilde tilde was little n over big N to the one over P. <coughs> What's so special about P equals two? Um, okay, well, P equals one is very special because then the whole thing is an arithmetic progression. We get a uh, very, very uh, weak bounds um, and we can actually distinguish this from this. We know that this whole thing is not an arithmetic progression. Um, two is the next best thing. And then when little n is a power of two, we get an arithmetic progression and its length is the number of, sorry, when little n is a square uh, and little n is somebody to the two, we get an arithmetic progression and its length is the number of squares in here. So square root of that. If we were to put three here, then when little n was a cube, we would get an arithmetic progression. And it's, we, we would have to, with a number of cubes in this range, which would be like n to the one third. So there would be a similar phenomenon, but it would be weaker. And, and this thing with the square root is really sharp. <coughs> okay. Uh, okay, so let's compare the extension operator for the circle and the extension operator for this set A, the set of logarithms. Uh, so I wrote them both down. Uh, this is the arc length measure on the circle. Okay. This is the, ex A is the set of logarithms from capital N to two capital N. Okay. So the circle is not a straight line. And so there are estimates for the circle that are better than what you would have for the straight line. And the analog of that is that the set A is not an arithmetic progression. Um, and there are estimates for the set A that are better than what we would have for an arithmetic progression. So for the circle, the tangent direction of the circle is turning. And so that makes it not straight. And for the set A, the consecutive differences of the set A are shrinking and that makes it not an arithmetic progression. Okay. Um, so what are wave packets? I'll do a kind of quick review. So suppose I take an arc of the circle, which is in red, it's called theta. And a key thing about this arc is that it's contained in a rectangular box, which is pretty small, which is in that teal color, and it's called theta bar. And then, the lemma says that if, uh, if g theta is supported just on theta, so I take, I take a function supported just on this arc of the circle and I do the extension operator, what I get is roughly constant, the norm of the, norm of the extension operator is roughly constant on any translate of this dual rectangle, theta star. Okay, and the dual rectangle, the definition of the dual rectangle is that this length is the inverse of that length and this length is the inverse of that length, and they're oriented coherently. <coughs> so this is an important structural piece of information about this function. It's not obvious right away how to use it, but it turns out to have many, many uses um, because it's, 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 it gives quite a lot of information about this, this function. Okay, so what's the analog? So here's the set A of all of the logarithms from n to 2n. And I'm going to take a piece of it. This is kind of like an arc. It's called i. And it's just some of them in a row. OK. And then I'd like to put that thing inside of some more organized, surround it with a more organized set that would be like a rectangle. And the thing that's like a rectangle is called a fat arithmetic progression. It's a neighborhood with some thickness, which is called little r here, of an arithmetic progression. So that's the teal thing in the picture. So the, the idea here is that the consecutive differences are changing slowly. So they're not exactly the same, but they're approximately the same as each other. And if I use this rectangle to give me a sort of fudge, fudge room of r, then the actual sequence is contained in um, a sequence of copies of this um, interval uh, of, of, of length r 
and in this sequence is uh, the, it's a um, so this is the R neighborhood of an arithmetic progression. The thing T. Okay, and that's helpful because the characteristic function, uh, so the R neighborhood of an arithmetic progression is just as nice an object in Fourier analysis as a rectangle. And you can adapt all the arguments about rectangles. And it says that um, the extension operator of GI, GI is supported in I, is constant on translates of some dual object called I star, which is also a fat AP. And Bergan worked out you know, what is exactly the definition of this, how long is this, how many intervals are there, how long is that, and so on. Okay. So Bergan used that to prove a neat theorem about the Montgomery conjecture that Michael mentioned at the, at the beginning. He proved that the Montgomery conjecture implies the Kakea conjecture. He also proved that in the statement of the Montgomery conjecture, you need that like double tilde thing. You need an extra factor of log t for it to be true. The proof idea of both of these things is the following. So for each i, you can choose gi so that the extension operator of gi is concentrated on a single translate of that set i star. And you can, it could be any single, you can translate them around. It could be any single translate of i star because if I modulate g, and I translate eg. Okay, so I have a bunch of translates of, I, of I, different I stars, and I'd, I'd like them to overlap a lot with each other. Um, and um, it's, it's not clear how much they can be made to overlap, but if they can be made to overlap a lot, then you can break Montgomery's conjecture a lot. The only thing we know how to do is to make them overlap by a factor of about, <coughs> of about log t. And that breaks Montgomery's original conjecture by a factor of log t that Bergan showed that you needed to add. Um, okay. The idea of this, for people who know what this is, is analogous to Pfefferman's counterexample to the ball multiplier. Okay. Um, so, so Bergan used these wave packets in kind of a negative way. You know, so in, in the world of restriction, wave packets were used to show that the restriction conjecture implies the Kakea conjecture. So that's kind of a negative use that suggests that restriction conjecture is hard. But they've also been used to make a lot of partial progress on the restriction conjecture. And in the Montgomery world, Bergan used wave packets in a similar way to show that the Montgomery conjecture implies the Kakea conjecture. So that's kind of a negative way of using it. It suggests the Montgomery conjecture is hard. Um, but I was wondering if we could do something like this. Can we use wave packets to make incremental progress on Montgomery's conjecture? For example, could we make a delta of progress on um, the challenge problem? And I worked on that with Yu Cho Fu and Dominique Maldog. And we took um, a bunch of different ways that wave packets have been used in restriction and in decoupling, and we tried to adapt them to the setting of the Montgomery conjecture. Um, and well, we proved some things, but we didn't make any progress on Montgomery. And in particular, we didn't make any progress on that um, uh, challenge problem. And there's an issue that I realized is that the wave packets for Kakea and wave, pa wave packets for restriction and wave packets for um, for Montgomery are, are different in a, in a key way. So here's the issue. Um, if you look at a wave packets for the circle and you have an arc theta, as long as that arc is a bit less than the whole circle, then there's a wave packet structure which is really non-trivial and really helpful. Um, so as long as this arc is significantly shorter than the whole circle, you can take a, draw this little rectangle. And what non-trivial means, I think a good translation is that this rectangle is a lot smaller than a ball that contains the arc. So we have a lot more frequency information and, and, and we get something useful. Whereas <coughs> for Dirichlet polynomials, um, there is a, a, a threshold. So, so we're looking at the set of logarithms 
from capital N to two capital N, the diameter of that whole set of real numbers is around one. So, so that whole thing is one. And we take a small piece of it. If the diameter of the small piece is less than root N, maybe significantly less than root N, then when you put a fat AP around it, you get something non-trivial that looks like the fat APs that I drew. But as this set I gets bigger, the fat AP has to get thicker because the consecutive spacing is changing more and more. Um, and at a certain moment, the fat AP gets so thick that um, this one here touches the next one, touches the next one. And so this set I bar is not really a fat AP, it's just an interval that contains uh, all of these points. And the threshold where that happens is pretty small. It's diameter square root of M, much smaller than the whole set. And once I is bigger than that, there isn't really any wave packet structure to help us. We're, we're just saying that this set of points is contained in this interval and nothing interesting uh, emerges from that observation. Oh, so I'm getting near the end of my time. Um, so let me, <laughs> so I think I'll stop at this slide, that wave packets are not enough to rule out this enemy scenario and make progress on the challenge problem. And there are two issues. There are two reasons I feel that way. One issue is that if you compare the logarithm sequence and our enemy sequence, they have exactly the same wave packets. So wave packets just do nothing at all to distinguish these two sequences. All right, now you still might hope to distinguish the little l2 from the little l infinity on the right hand side, um, but wave packets don't seem to help with that either. Because in the enemy scenario, um, this function here, if I had a diameter smaller than n to the minus a half, th these functions were just constant. They were boring functions. Um, so there's no interesting behavior to try to bound when I was small in, in, in the enemy scenario. And on the other hand, when I was big, the function was starting to do something interesting. But when I is big, there were no wave packets. So wave packets aren't going to buy, aren't going to, uh, don't tell us anything in that range. Okay. So it was, I, you know, it was, it was, I had some feelings as this gradually sank in because I loved wave packets and tried to use wave packets and, you know, worked with them for a, more than a decade. Um, we liked them so much in our group that with some of our graduate students graduated this year. And one of my graduating graduate students, Rose Zhang, she gave all of us a, a little pin with a Kakea set on it, a Besikovic set, um, because we like them so much. Um, anyway, so, the, so, so the, the, the wave packets and the Kakea stuff, uh, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a neat and important thing. But for this problem here, it seems to me that it is not, uh, going, it's not do, doing anything helpful. Um, and so we need, New ideas. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Well, thank you for a very stimulating and engaging lecture. We've already had several questions, and we have time for a small bit more. Well, a question that occurred to me is uh, in, num in number theory, if you can't solve a problem, you make a conjecture that implies the problem. So is there some, do you have anything in mind for that? Oh. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I've been toying with a conjecture that you can find all of the LP bonds for an extension operator by testing a rather small list of functions that come from arithmetic progressions and small variations on that. Um, and well, that conjecture, I guess, would, would imply the Montgomery conjecture, but it would be 
harder and more likely to be false. Um, um, yeah, no, let me, I, I'll try, I'll write some version. Okay, so suppose we have a set A in, in ZT. So people are probably familiar with the hardy Littlewood majorant. Uh, uh, let's call it a proposition, which says that if, um, um, if P is an even integer, and if G L infinity is at most one, then E A G LP is at most E A of one. So this says that if you want to understand the L infinity to LP mapping properties of this extension operator, <laughs> you only need to try one function, which is the function one. And um, Hardy, Little, Hardy and Littlewood raised the question whether something like this is true for P that are not even integers. And the full strength of it, it's not true, um, but there are still only a few kinds of functions G that come up in the literature. And so I've, I'm playing with a naive conjecture that to figure out the Q to P mapping properties, you still might only have to check a, a few functions uh, G. So vague conjecture. Um, e A G L P is less than or equal to C GLQ, um, if for all G, if it's true for G in a short list. Uh, okay, so what would be in this list? Um, maybe characteristic function of an arithmetic progression, and maybe um, the, the, the counterexample to Hardy that would major in is a sort of a tensor product. Uh, G1 tensor, G2 tensor, G3, dot, 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 uh, where GI is supported in a small set, maybe convolved with that of notation. Because the special feature of a convolution is if I take the Fourier transform of that, I get the product of the Fourier transforms of these, and that's a special structure that, 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 that people can work. Okay, so I'm, I, yeah, I'm not sure exactly what should be on this short list, but the, the, the diversity of examples that have appeared in the literature is really not that, uh, not that many. Well, thank you for a wonderful talk and a wonderful way to end the fourth day of this uh, week. Thank you again, Larry. Yeah, thank you all. There's some question in the Yeah, so I see a question in the chat. I mean, people are leaving you do your thing, but uh, I'll hang out for a couple minutes and talk with whoever wants to talk. Question in the chat is that if you look at the large I regime, which I said is problematic here, um, <laughs> could we deal with it by some kind of induction on scale? Um, Um, I don't see how to do that. Um, no induction on scale, it, you know, all, all these proofs by induction, you can usually either write them using induction literally, or you can write them as like an iteration where you do something many times. Um, and so induction on scales usually Basically, there's some estimate that's true at each scale, and you take a bunch of these estimates and you put them together in a long line. Um, and at these scales, I don't currently know any useful estimates. Um, so 
then taking those not useful estimates and putting them together in a long line. They, or, or let me say, I, I don't know any estimates that distinguish the challenge problem from the enemy scenario. And if we take some estimates that are true in the enemy scenario and we put them together in a line, we'll just get something that's true in the enemy scenario. You have such a stimulating talk, Larry. It has also occurred to me you could potentially restrict to special ends like smooth numbers or something. That um, um, then the logarithms would have a special structure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea too. I don't know much about smooth numbers. It's a restriction on the primes that divide. A typical definition is the primes, the primes that divide the integers don't exceed a certain level. Right. No, no big primes. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I what what I was feeling is like I could ask you know, are, is there any set A where we can prove an estimate that's better than the the, the Montgomery estimate? Uh, you know, that beats the that beats the the, the challenge problem. Um, so th there is um, if, if A is kind of a faithful model of restriction for some surface or curve, then we can do better. Um, and, but we can do better because of wave packets. And if we make a rule, some kind of rule, okay, you can't use wave packets. Is there any other tool to prove for any set A an estimate that's better than the enemy scenario? Uh, I don't know. I don't know any example. 